Amen. It's good to see everybody this evening. I'm glad to see everybody just enjoying each other's company and talking and having a great time. Amen. All right, let's stand, please. We're going to go start at number 351. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Number 351. First, third, and fourth, okay? Are you weary? Are you heavy-hearted? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joy departed? Tell it to Jesus alone, oh, yes. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Oh, wait a minute. Which ones did I say? One, two, and four? One, three, and four. Okay. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Do you fear the gathering clouds of sorrow? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Are you anxious? What for me tomorrow? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You know such a friend or brother, tell it to Jesus alone. Amen. That's what you got to do. Pray about everything, everything, no matter how little, how big, whatever. Amen. Give it to the Lord because he can take care of it all. Amen. Sometimes you need wisdom and he can give that. Amen. Sometimes you need a friend. He can give that too. Amen. Amen. 236. One, three, and five. Help me remember that, Lord. One, three, and five. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Amen. And the third. There's not an hour that he is not near us. No, not one. No, not one. No night so dark, but his love can cheer us. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Let me get my breath. There it is. Okay, number five. <laughs> Was there a gift like the Savior given? No, not one. 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 Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. And all God's people said, Amen. Yes, yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. I love that third verse. talks about uh, there's not an hour where he is not near us. Amen. There's not a trouble where he cannot cheer us. Amen. I don't know about you. I love the poetry of the hymns. I started uh, writing poetry when I was in, in high school, and I enjoyed, I enjoyed writing and loved seeing the poetry and how they use those words and, uh, and then put it to music. Amen. Praise the Lord. We have a Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, to always be near us. Amen. Are you happy you're saved? Yeah. Amen. Amen. It's good to see you all in the house of God. Amen. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Brother Brown, would you please uh, open us up in a word of prayer? Amen. 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 Amen.
Turn to page 343. First, third, and fourth. First, third, and fourth. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Now, which ones did I say again? It just going from me here. You don't mind, do you, if we just get real here? <laughs> Actually, they're all good, so, you know, it's kind of hard to pick three. Usually, when I, when I usually led singing, I just sang them all. Then I didn't have this problem, see. On the third. <laughs> All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Yes, make us so, Lord. I'm getting kind of anxious. I wanted to sit down, I guess. <laughs> Actually, this morning I marked the verses. Tonight I forgot to mark the verses. I'm sorry. You have to bear with me. On the last one, and make it so, Lord, revive us. Amen. Amen. <laughs> revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May so be Must like my singing. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Nothing but the blood? That, that where we're at? Number 30. First, second, and fourth. After the first verse, put up a two, will you, there, Tony? <laughs> what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the that makes me white as snow No other fount I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus For my pardon this I see Nothing but the blood of Jesus For my cleansing this I plead Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. On the last. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow.
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Bunny, for the great time today, and, and, and uh, thanks for filling in. I appreciate that. Let's go to the announcements right quick. Uh, don't forget that we have our missions conference coming up October 4th through the 7th. That's in a couple weeks. And uh, praise the Lord, uh, Brother Sarah Mack, I saw an announcement today that his wife had a healthy baby girl. So we're going to have a little baby in the nursery uh, with Jonathan. And uh, she just better stay away from him <laughs> and keep them, you know, six feet apart, eight, ten feet apart. But, uh, but praise the Lord for that. And uh, so uh, they've got a little one and they've got four boys and then... We've also got the Shoe family and their children. They're going to be with us, and then Brother and Mrs. Fulton. And I've asked the, the missionaries, uh, those, those who have uh, specials that they would like to sing, to uh, prepare us something to sing. So we're going to get to enjoy some time uh, listening to them and, and really just uh, maximize our time with them. So just be in prayer, con uh, continue to be in prayer for that. Also, uh, the ladies' tea uh, is, is noon on Monday of the missions conference, and then the men, we have the, the missionaries' breakfast at uh, 7 o'clock at Big Boy in Chelsea. Uh, don't forget that a week from tonight, we're, we will be honoring the, uh, the Leonard family and thanking them and showing our appreciation to them uh, for their many years of service here at our church. So let's be, uh, be uh, ready to be a blessing to them. And also, we're going to be having some cake and ice cream afterwards. And um, so let's, uh, let's just keep that in mind. Uh, at the end of October, we've got the chili cook-off. I mentioned that this morning. Uh, sharpen, sharpen your skills, your culinary skills, and get ready for having a fun time. Uh, also, uh, we're going to be having, we'll be ha have a game night and have some fun over in the gym, so just uh, be ready for that. Um, also, uh, be, be talking to your friends this week um, about a friend day. Your coworkers, your neighbors, your your friends. Be sure, be sure to to talk to them about this friend day and let them know it's just a churchwide pizza party. We want to invite our our uh, coworkers and neighbors uh, to have a, a fun time with us. And don't forget that the ladies, uh, we've got the the uh, the Winter Wonderland uh, Ladies Conference over at Metro Baptist Church that we are trying to to see if anybody wants to go. And we we're more than willing to take a, a church vehicle or pack everybody in a vehicle and and have a good time. And uh, over there, that's uh, in December, December 4th and 5th, and then also November 8th through 11th is the Fresh Oil Conference, so keep that in mind. There will be a sign-up sheet uh, showing up and appearing on the bulletin board at some point this week, right? Right? So it just magically appears these things happen, right? Amen. Amen. Anybody have a blessing they'd like to share this evening? Or a word of testimony? Maybe the Lord did something special and you want to share a testimony? Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Anybody else have a word of praise? Yes, sir. Amen. It is. It is good to be a. Amen. Amen. That's good. Anybody else? Yes, sir. That's good. 
That's good for them to open up, and then you get to take those things to God in prayer and, and uh, really pray for them in a special way. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, amen. Amen. Anybody else have a word of praise they'd like to, to share with the church? Anybody else? All right, let's grab our hymn books. Let's go to number 145. Number 145. I'm going to ask Brother Bunny to come and lead us in the song, It Is Well With My Soul. Let's think about the words as we sing this precious hymn of the faith. Brother Bunny, come and lead us. Yes, 145. We'll do all four verses. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> And Lord, haste the day when 
the faith shall be sight the clouds be rolled back that... wait a minute let's start that again <laughs> I lost track somewhere along the way I'm sorry <laughs> On the last verse. Oh, wait a minute. Did I fit the, forget the chorus? That's what happened. <laughs> honey, pray for me. Please pray for me, honey. It's just getting worse all the time up here. Let's go back to the chorus, and then we'll go to the next verse, okay? It is well with my soul. It Never say I don't make mistakes. On the last, oh Lord, bless it. And Lord, haste the day when the face shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound. my job. <laughs> Amen. Let's grab our Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 23. 1 Samuel chapter 23. 1 Samuel chapter 23, we'll read verses 8 through 16. I'll have Brother Bunny come and he will guide us and lead us in the reading. Let's all stand please for the reading of God's word. 1 Samuel chapter 23, verses 8 through 16. Eight through sixteen. I'll start with a verse, and we'll probably end up both having to read the last verse. But anyway, chapter twenty-three, verse eight. And Saul called all the people together to war, to go down to Keilah, to besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him, and he said to Abiathar the priest, "Bring hither the ephod." Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Tegila to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keila deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then said David, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee up. Then David and his men, which were about 600, then departed out of Keilah and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah, and he forbear to go forth. And David abode in the wilderness in strongholds, and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Zith. And Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Zith, in a wood, and then together. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose, and went to David under the wood, and strengthened his hand in God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the reading of your word. Lord, I thank you so much that you've given us a full copy of your word. Thank you so much for the men and Christians of yesteryear that dedicated and risked their lives to give us your word. Lord, help us as a church to always treasure reading it together 
like a family would, having family altar and time around your word. May it be a special memory for us as our church family as we gather together. Lord, please bless the service this evening. I pray that you please bless the special. May it lift hearts. May it touch lives. And Lord, bless the preaching of your word most of all. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. the Lord. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 23. What a me- wonderful message of the song. Great job, Mr. Tompkins. Great job. Good job. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 23, verses 8 through 16 was our text. In verse 14, it says, And David abode in the wilderness and strongholds and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph, and Saul sought him every day. But God delivered him not into his hand. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. You notice what it said. Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. Look at verse 16. It says, And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. This evening I want to preach a message called The Best Way You Can Help Another. I want us to look at this story, this uh, special story that's between Jonathan and, and David and, and see how we can help each other and how we can uh, be a blessing to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I praise and thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to preach your word. I ask you, Lord, to please guide my thoughts. I pray that you please feed us from your word. Lord, help us, Lord, to have a heart for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, help us, Lord. To, to live our Christian life, our, our private Christian life. Help us to live it in a way, Lord, that we would be, be a blessing to our brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, that we could do what Jonathan did. 
And Lord, help us, Lord, to see how what Jonathan did at this point in David's life, how it helped him in the future. And Lord, I ask that you please speak to us through your word. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Hide me up behind the cross of Jesus. May Jesus shine and may he have the preeminence. Lord, I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. As you know, for many years, Israel had judges that, that if you want to say ruled the land, they, uh, they helped guide the people as God, the king, uh, ruled the land. But then there came a day when Israel said, we want a king, we want to, we want to be like the other nations. And so Samuel, he told them he was the last judge, and he told them, you've rejected the Lord from being your king. But the Lord said, you know, this thing is from me. Go ahead and choose a king. Well, the first king that, they, that, they, that was chosen by God was Saul. And Saul uh, was a man who was head and shoulders above all of the children of Israel. Very goodly to look upon, the Bible says. And his heart was humble in the beginning. As time went on, he became, became king and... and the Lord gave him an instruction, and you see, you know through the story that he, he didn't obey the instruction, and God gave him an instruction about the Amalekites, and, and Saul adjusted the, the instructions to, 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 to a more convenient plan. He didn't destroy all the Amalekites, and, and that to God was, was, I'm sorry, I don't do three strikes, but I, two strikes and you're out. That just confirms what my suspicions were about your heart. Two or three witnesses, the Bible says, let every word be established. And you've proven to me what's in your heart, and you don't have an obedient heart, Saul. So he took, he declared to Saul that he was going to take the kingdom away from him and give it to another whose heart was after him. Well, David comes on the scene later on, and he captures the heart of the, of the people, and they're singing his praises. Saul is slain his thousands, David is ten thousands. And that, that song, that top, top ten song of the nation, <laughs> if you want to call it that, of the day, that really irked the king. He could not stand that song because they were giving more glory to, to David instead of the king. And there was a jealousy, there was an envy that entered into Saul as, as he, he continued reigning, and, and he constantly sought after the life of David, so much so that, that David, we find here that he, he, had to, he had to hide himself in the wilderness, in caves and rocks, and he, he couldn't even live peaceably. And there came a time where David was so discouraged that he said, I, 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 wanted, I feel like there's a step between me and death, and if I don't leave Israel, I'm going to... I'm going to end up being killed by the hand of Saul. And so he abode in wilderness and strongholds. He remained in the mountains. He, if you can envision Robin Hood out in the, the Sherwood Forest, he's, he's not welcome in the cities. He's, he's hiding out uh, in, in, a, in a wooded place. And he, noticed, he knows his enemy is constantly practicing mischief, it says, Verse 9, it says, And Saul secretly practiced mischief against them. Verse, uh, verse 8, it says that Saul called all the people to go to Keilah to besiege David and his men. David is a picture of a Christian. Saul is a picture of that. The, it could be the old man or it could be the picture of our enemy. And Saul desired to besiege David and his men and to, to bring them to death. It says that David hid in the wilderness, and Saul sought him every day, but God would not let Saul find him. But his own son, Saul's son, Jonathan, went straight to David in the wilderness, and he did something very special. He strengthened his hand in God. Amen. This evening, I want to talk to you about the best way to help another. I'd like to, for us to look at this scripture and 
and break it down and, and see how this correlates, how this uh, uh, is similar to our Christian life and, and our brothers and sisters in Christ and how, how uh, the, the Satan wants to attack them and bring them down. And he wants to, to be like a roaring lion seeking to devour them. Let's go to 1 Samuel 23, verse 8. It says in verse 8, it says, And Saul called all the people to, to, together to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. The first thing I notice here is that your enemy wants to besiege you. That word besiege, is, it's a military term. It means to starve out. He, it means to surround. It means to cut off. It means to, to keep anything. What, what, a, a military tactic back in the day, these, these, these cities were, were fenced cities, walled cities. And that was, that was the most fortified cities of the day. If you think of uh, the feudal system and the castles and, the, and, and, and different things in Europe, you, you have the, kind of the idea of, of this uh, pre-modern era type of, um, excuse me, type of, uh, of city and, and protection. And to besiege the city, you would just surround the city. You would have a big enough army that you could totally surround the city and cut, any, cut off anything going out or in. And eventually, that's, that's why these castles and these, these places, they had storehouses because of these things that might happen. They needed to be able to make it through the, the, the time of uh, be, being besieged and, and in case it was uh, battle time. And, and the whole idea of besieging was to starve out, was to, was to wear them down. You remember in 2 Kings, it talks about how that been hated king of Syria gathered a host and went up and besieged Samaria. This was during the day of, of the, the, the great prophet. And it says, there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four, hundred, four score pieces of silver. That's 80 pieces of silver. And a fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. That's how desperate measures got, that they were, they were eating these things in these conditions. And your enemy, he wants to besiege you. He wants to cut your life off. He, it, 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 you may not notice the effects at first, or you may not uh, notice the, 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 the end goal at first, but it's slowly wearing you down and wearing you down to the point to where you surrender. And that's what David's enemy did. He, he besieged him. He wanted to starve him out. And that's what his, his intentions were. And we look at verse 9, it says that David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. First Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. In here, here he met Abiathar, the priest, and he prayed for direction, and, and, and God gave him direction because he knew what his enemy was up to. He knew that, that it was a cat and mouse game. He had to stay on the run. He had to stay on the move because his enemy practiced mischief against him. And if you don't realize that your enemy is practicing mischief against you, then, then, then you're going to be a, a victim of his. We've got an enemy, and that's Satan. He wants to practice mischief in the, in the most subtle ways. The seemingly innocent things that, 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 that he wants to offer us are always laced with a little strychnine. Right. Always laced with a little poison. And so David knew what his enemy was up to. In verse 14, it says that David abode in the wilderness in strongholds. He was somewhere in the wilderness and Saul couldn't find him because God would not allow him to find him. And then we see that David, he saw that King Saul was come out to seek his life. And in verse 16, it, see, it, it, it states that Jonathan, when his, even though his dad could not find David, Jonathan went straight to David. Interesting. But look at this very important action that Jonathan did. It says in verse 16, And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into wood and strengthened his hand in God. This is what Harvest Baptist Church has got to be all about. This is what Harvest Baptist Church has got to be all about. We must realize what the enemy wants to do to our lives and any other life that comes in our doors. Satan wants to besiege them. He wants to choke out the life. He wants to, he wants to besiege this property and this church and each one of our homes. And he wants to choke out the life and kill and shut the doors, just like we talked about this morning about Hezekiah's father who wanted to shut the doors 
of this church. But we, we must realize that our enemy wants to, to take those lives. He wants to choke out the light. He wants to starve out the truth. How many years has this church been soul winning and preaching the gospel in the middle of this cow pasture? And Satan is tired of it. We also must be aware of what our enemy is doing behind the scenes during, quote unquote, peaceful times. There's never a peaceful time in the spiritual life. Right. If, if, you, if, if you don't understand that there's, there are no peaceful times, yeah. you're going to be a victim. Right. You've got to use, quote unquote, peaceful times to get in God's word and to get yourself practiced up and, 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 and get yourself ready for the next attack. What, what do soldiers do whenever there is no peaceful time? Do the, do, do, do the, does the Navy, uh, they're, out in the, they're, they're out, uh, out in the ocean and they're floating on the boat. Are they just, uh, you know, having, you know, little uh, cocktail drinks with, with little uh, umbrellas in them and laying out on the deck of the ship? What are they, are they doing that? No, they're doing uh, drills. Why? Why in the world would they do that? Because they're getting ready. They're staying on ready. And that's what we've got to do. We must be aware we've got an enemy that, that even though it's a peaceful time, he may not be attacking us directly, but he's practicing mischief behind our backs. Right. And he's preparing for that evil day that Ephesians talks about. He's practicing mischief. What does he want? He seeks to devour. Yeah. He seeks to devour. I was reminded of, of the tactics of a, of a lion First Peter talks about our, our enemy being a roaring lion and how a roaring lion, whenever he attacks his prey, he, he, he starts over here and the, a lion has a very strong odor about him. And what he does is, is he, he will roar over here or he will make some noise over here, but he goes in a circle path and he surrounds, he wants to besiege his enemy. And so he's got his prey and he goes in a circle. And what he's doing is he is leaving his scent all the way around that circle. But every time he goes around in that circle, the circle gets tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. So that whenever the prey all of a sudden realizes, oh my goodness, there's a lion around and starts running. He runs this way and smells, oh, there's a lion. I'm going to run this way and runs this way and smells, there's a lion. And he's frozen with fear. And he's a victim. During these peaceful times, our enemy is always practicing mischief. You may see a brother or sister in Christ that is going through a peaceful time and, and, and maybe the Lord is, uh, is not trying them or they don't have a trial in their life, but that does not mean that, the, that their enemy is not practicing mischief behind their backs. We've got to understand that, 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 that I need to live my Christian life, yes, to, to develop my walk with God and to, to strengthen my walk with God, but also my brother needs me. My brother needs me to be strong because he may fall under attack, and I need to, what, what happened here with Jonathan, I need to be ready to be that. Number three, we must hide ourselves from our enemy. David lived in the wilderness. The wilderness is a humbling place. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 2, it says, I brought you into the wilderness to humble you. And the wilderness is a humble place. You don't have the conveniences of home in the wilderness. I'm sorry, I've never seen a cave with an indoor bathroom. Just, just, I haven't seen it. Not yet. Maybe they, maybe they have it, but that takes a lot of doing. Or with, uh, with, with uh, all the modern conveniences of a kitchen or, or nice uh, plush furniture. Uh, but we must hide ourselves from our enemy. We must never take a day off from God. We must hide in the wilderness, wilderness with God. Saul sought him every day. The only way that, that, that we will be able to, to, to avoid being caught by our enemy is by our consistency, by, by the diet of God's word that we feed ourselves with. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 30. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, Years have passed. You remember back when he was hiding in the wood that Jonathan found him. And what very important thing did Jonathan do? He strengthened his hand in God. Here in 1 Samuel 30, Jonathan is not around. Jonathan is nowhere to be found. 
Verse 1, it says, And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south in Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. This is after the time where, where David said, there's but a step between me and death. I'm going to go into the land of the Philistines until, until Saul gives up seeking for me. Twice, God had given David the opportunity to kill his king and to, to relieve him of his enemy, but David did not take that opportunity. He said, I'm not going to stretch my hand against, against the Lord's anointed. But eventually David gets worn down and he, and he says, I, I fear my life. I'm going to leave. I'm going to go to the Philistines. And so this is that time where he goes and he serves Achish, one of the Philistine kings. And then he wants to go to war and the Philistines want to go to war against Israel. And the other five Philistine kings says, hey, uh, who's, who's one of your generals in your army, Achish? Isn't that David, the one that they sang that popular top 10 song? You remember that top 10 song about a few years ago? They were singing about him, and you're going to take him to go fight against his own people? Won't he turn against us in battle and kill us? And they said, uh-uh, that's not happening. You send him home. Achish, he knew David was loyal, and he, was, he had great character, but he, he said, hey, the kings, the Philistine kings, they said, nope, you got to go home. Well, during this time, the Amalekites... Malachites. Where did I hear that name from? Oh, that's right. Saul. Saul was supposed to destroy all of them. Well, he, 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 he left some of them alive. And so these Amalekites, they, they came back to, to, to haunt Israel. And these Amalekites, they had invaded from the south, south and Ziklag. Ziklag was the, the city that Achish gave to David and his men to inhabit. And so the Amalekites come in, they invade from the south, they smote Ziklag, they burned it with fire, verse 2, and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Hanoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. Notice who's not here. Jonathan is not here. This is many years later, but look what David was able to do. Verse 6, it says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. In this chapter, David is prepared to go to battle. He was not allowed to go to battle. His men return home. They find that there are the, all their families and all their possessions have been taken away. He's under the threat of death by his own friends and his, the, his, the people he has helped. David did not have Jonathan here. But he learned something with Jonathan. Jonathan did something in his life way back then that David was able to draw upon at this day. David was able to encourage himself in the Lord because Jonathan taught, he strengthened his hand in God back then. In chapter 31 of this same, of this same book, we find that Jonathan is killed on the battlefield with his father. But before Jonathan's death, David was, David was able to take a stand on his own with God. I said, this is what the Harvest Baptist Church, Church has got to be all about. We have got to be all about strengthening the hand of our brother and sister in God. We've been praying for new families. We've been praying for new families. And these families, we cannot expect them to be ready to go. We've got to expect them to need somebody to strengthen their hand in God. Uh, something interesting, I was counseling with some pastors at, and uh, before before I, I came here, and uh, one of the things that they said was, you have to realize that there is no perfect church. If you ever find a perfect church, they would not need a pastor. That's right. Amen. 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 
Well, I'm telling you, if the Lord brings us new families and the Lord brings us families that we've been praying for and answers that prayer, the Bible, we're going to have to be like a Jonathan to them and we're going to have to strengthen their hand in God and, and we're going to have to teach them and point them in the right way. There's coming a day when we will need to step into the role of Jonathan for some new family of believers. So I want us to look at what Jonathan said to David when David was in need of a Jonathan. Let's look back and find out what did Jonathan tell David that made such a difference to help him be ready for his ziklag. Because everybody's going to have a ziklag when, the, when everything is taken away, when the test, when the threat of death is upon them. And they're going to have to know what to do. Let's go back to 1 Samuel 23. 1 Samuel 23. 1 Samuel 23, verse 17, it says, And he said unto him, if you look at verse 16, this is Jonathan, Saul's son, arose, went to David in the wood, and strengthened his hand at God. And he, Jonathan, said unto him, Fear not. The first thing that Jonathan encouraged David to do was fear not. And that's what we've got to teach. And that's what we've got to encourage these new families and these, our brothers and sisters, even now, we have got to encourage each other. Fear not, trust God, trust God. My, my friend, if, if, if you hear a story from a brother in, in, or a sister here in the church, and, and you can, you can see this is a test in this certain Bible principle, well, show them that say, Hey, listen, God's word says to do this. Trust God. Trust God. Don't fear. Don't, don't go with what man would say to do. Trust God. Trust God. At God's word. Apply his principle in your life. We need to be an example of faith for them. An example of faith. We need God to increase our faith because they're going to come and they're going to be looking at us as, wow, how long have you been in this church? 20 years? Wow, you must be some wonderful, awesome, great Christian, right? That's how they're going to look at us. Yeah. We need to be an example of faith. We have our missions conference coming up. This is a perfect time for us to stretch our faith. That's something that I've always challenged myself to do is every missions conference is, is just, can, can, I, can I push the envelope a little further? Can I push a little further? Can I push a little further? And over time, the Lord has given, increased that faith. And this is a perfect time for us to increase our faith. But these new families that, that the Lord is going to give us, we need to, have, we need to ask the Lord to increase our faith. That's what the disciples asked. When Jesus said, hey, you know, you need to learn how to forgive. You, and if a person asks you seven times in a day for the same thing, forgive, uh, you need, to, you need to, to forgive them. And, and the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. Wow, that's going to take a lot of faith to, to forgive somebody seven times in one day. And then he says, no, 70 times seven, 490 times. In other words, stop counting. But he, we need to be an example of faith. And he says to David, fear not, trust God. Look at verse 17. It says, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find thee. Remind them, number two, remind them that if they stay in God's secret place, they will be protected from whatever apparent danger that comes to them. Jonathan said, the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find thee. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It doesn't matter what fearful thing comes into your life. If you abide, if you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, you'll abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The Bible says in Psalms 18 11, he made darkness his secret place. Psalms 18 and verse 2, it says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my strength, my buckler, my high tower. And we need, to, we need to remind them, don't fear. We need to remind them, hey, you need to develop a walk with God. Amen. That's what we need to impress upon the, the, the families and the, the people that God gives us. You have got to get, get a walk with God because they may be, they may be in a wilderness situation today, but, but in the future, 20, 30 years down the road, they may have a ziklak moment. And when that Ziklak moment, when, 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 when their life is threatened, when, when it seems the bottom drops out, what they do in that moment will define them. 
What, what if David had died at that moment? Then David, Saul, and Jonathan would have all died around the same amount of time. And then who would have been the second king of Israel? It wouldn't have been David. Who would have written the Psalms? It wouldn't have been David. But because Jonathan helped him during this wilderness moment and helped strengthen his hand in God and taught him, hey, you need to develop a walk with God. You need to, to spend time in God's word and make it life or death. Do not go 24 hours without opening God's word and without getting in God's word. Make it a priority. Because one day you're going to have a Ziklag moment. One day you're going to have a time where it's, it, it seems the world is going to be ending for you and you're going to have to know how to encourage yourself in God. You're going to have to draw off of all those times that you strengthened your hands on your own. Walking with God is the most important act of your entire Christian life. Walking with God, spending time in God's word, getting in God's word, praying and, and developing that time. And, and, and whenever the Lord allows a, a, a new Christian or a younger Christian to, to be around you, that ought to be what we talk about. That ought to be what we encourage. Hey, how is your quiet time? Hey, hey, what are you getting out of God's word? And, and, and we encourage those new families. Hey, let, let, strengthen their hand in God because they're going to have a ziklak, ziklak moment. Go to verse 17. It says, the next phrase, it says, and thou shalt be king over Israel. How can we help another? How did Jonathan help David? He said to him, fear not, trust God. He said to him, hey, you've got to develop a secret place. You've got to go to your secret place with God and spend time alone with God. That has got to be a priority. Number And the next I want you to know your potential. He says, thou, Jonathan says to David, Jonathan is in line to be king, but Jonathan says to David, thou shalt be king over Israel. What was he saying to David? You've got greatness in you. You've got potential. And that's what we've got to tell him. You've got potential. You've got potential to, 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 do, uh, to do something great for God. Help them realize their potential for God. They have greatness in store for them. What excites me and what I dream about is, is, Lord, what families are you going to give us? And, Lord, the children, the children that you give us, what are you going to, what are you going to cause them to become? I can't wait to see. I can't wait to, to cheer them on and to, to be there for them and to, to, to provide a good, good, wholesome atmosphere for them to raise their children and to be able to fulfill those dreams that God puts in their heart and to be, to, to be involved in their life because they have potential. There's royalty in them, and I want, them, I want to help them achieve that potential. And this is what Jonathan was doing to David. He says, thou shalt be king over Israel. I know you're going to be king. I know it. You have greatness in store for you, David. It was during this wilderness moment, during this time of discouragement, where Jonathan was able to pick him up and give him that hope. Hey, God's got a great plan for you, and that's what we've got to do to our brothers and sisters in Christ. It, 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 should, it, it should not be that, hey, a new family or a, a, somebody new to our church gets this great encouragement and the ones that we see all the time does not. It should be such a practice. It should be such a normalcy that somebody else comes in and they just get mixed in with what's normal around here. We just encourage each other. We're just all the time boosting each other up and we're sharing uh, what God has taught us from his word and we're just encouraging each other and praying for each other and, and giving. And, and, and we have such a bond and a network here that people come and, and then they just get stuck in this network of, of just being, being loved and, and growing the Lord. It ought to be normal around here. And that's why I say we, we've got to practice this first as, as, as a church. And then when the Lord brings people our way, then they, they just get caught up in it. And they're able to grow and they're able to, to, to be blessed and realize their potential. Verse 17, it says, And I shall be next unto thee. Jonathan said to David, Fear not. Trust God. Jonathan said to David, stay in your secret place. Make, make your quiet time. The hand of my Saul, my father, shall not find thee. Because, why? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. God's going to protect you. You stay close to God and he'll protect you. Then he says, thou shalt be king over Israel. You've got greatness in you. You've got potential. Then he says, and I shall be next unto thee. 
what you're saying is, I want to grow old with you serving the Lord together. I want to grow old with you serving the Lord together. I am so grateful for many of the folks who, who have, have, have been here for decades before I have ever arrived and to hear about their faithfulness and hear about what they've done for decades. I want to grow old, serving the Lord with my church family. Amen. And that's what we've got to remind each other. That's what we've got to tell each other. I'm going to be here. I'm going to, I'm going to be serving the Lord. I'm going to be walking with God. The Lord may, may uh, move somebody to, to a different church or a different location, but that should not change what we do. We should still walk with God. We should still win souls. We should still be faithful to the things of God. And then from a distance, we can encourage each other. You know, I've got friends down in Texas, and I, and I talked to them this week. I said, hey, listen, we're still, we're, uh, you, hey, I want to encourage you. Here's a little, here's a little message. But what, what I want them to know is, hey, what I was down there, I'm still doing here. We're still growing old together. Uh-huh. Jonathan said to David, I shall be next unto thee. I'm going to be with you on this trip. I may not be physically present, but in spirit, I'm going to be with you. Go to verse 17. It says, and that also my Saul, my father, knoweth. Saul was David's enemy. And Jonathan said, listen, Saul knows this. He knows you're going to be king. And how can we help our neighbor? How can we help another person? We can, te- we can help them by, by, by encouraging them, don't f- uh, fear, fear not, trust God. Encouraging them to, to develop a strong walk with God. And, and, and reminding them about the potential that God has for them. Reminding them that I'm going to be with you. That you're not alone in this. this. This trial is not just for you. I'm with you on this. And also remind them that Satan also knows how potentially destructive they can be to his kingdom. And that also Saul, my father, knoweth. He knows. Satan knows how destructive they can be. And that's what I want my friends here at this church. I want you to to destroy Satan's kingdom. And so that's why I encourage you, hey, get in God's word. Because I know you can be potentially destructive to his kingdom. But that's a good thing. And we we need to encourage each other. We need to help each other but especially those, those families that the Lord is going to give us. We need to encourage them. And then in verse 18, look at verse 18. And they too made a covenant before the Lord, and David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. The last thing, Jonathan made a pact with David. He made a covenant. He made a covenant that involved something like this. David, I'm going to pray for you daily. I'm going to pray for you daily. And this is something that you, you said I'm, you, you, could, you could say to, to your brothers and sisters in Christ or to, to a new family that the Lord blesses us with. You could commit that you're going to pray for them daily. You, you can commit, you're going to have a consistent walk with God. You see, you can't, it's hard to strengthen your hand in God when your walk with God is weak. It's hard to do. And so that's why, that's why I, I keep circling the wagons around this idea of, of, of strong walk with God because I know that eventually God's going to bring us people and that's what we need to encourage them to do is to, to walk with God. That's going to get them through any valley of life. But you have to have, you can commit, you can tell them, I'm going to commit to you. I'm going to have a strong, consistent walk with God. You can also make a pact with them and commit yourself that you will be a public Christian example to them. Sadly, many Christians who, 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 who go to church, and I've been in church 30, 35 years, they feel like they, they have arrived at a point where they really don't have to live that strict of a Christian life. I'm sorry, but we're supposed to be growing in the Lord. As we grow, as we go in the Christian life, we should be becoming more like Christ, not less. Right? 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 We should be becoming more like Christ, not less. And so you commit to them. You, you say to them, I'm going to be a good public example of what a Christian ought to be to you. I'm, going to, I'm headed this way, and I want to get closer to Christ. And as I get closer to Christ, the Holy Spirit's going to convict me and move on my heart about things that I need to, to work on. And I want to grow and become more like Christ. But as I follow Christ, you follow me. Just like Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. 
Make a pact with them. Tell them, I, I promise you, I'm going to try to live as close to this book as I can. And then commit yourself that you'll always believe in them. You'll always believe in them. You know, a brother or a sister in Christ or a family, they may come and, and they may go through a, through a testing time and, and they may drop out of church or they may, they may struggle with sin, but, it, but, but you know what helps them come back? You know what helps them to get back uh, on the, on the, in the saddle again? Is somebody believing in them. Somebody believing in them. Somebody, somebody who says, listen, hey, I'm praying for you. I'm here for you. Not judging them, not putting them down, not thinking, hey, I'm better than you. I, I, I didn't do that mistake. But you've got to make a pact with them. You've got to commit yourself that you're always believing them. The love of Christ will win more people over than a judgmental spirit. The love of Christ will win more people over than a judgmental spirit. Unsought advice is many times unheeded advice. And when we as Christians think of ourselves higher than we ought to think, and we, 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 we judge people and we talk down about their Christian life as not as good, it, all, it, all it does is, is, is produce resentment. You know, the Bible, God does not yell at us when our lives are not right with him. He just simply says, just open my word. You'll get to my message eventually. Yeah. And this word is a still small voice and it convicts. And the Holy Spirit, when he convicts, can do a whole lot better job than any of us. That's right. And that's one thing as a, as a young man and as a, as a believer, I've learned over the years that you know, I, may, I may come across somebody and I see in their life, whoa, the Lord has got a lot of polishing to do on this person but it's not my place to to be the laser and cut at them i'm just i'm just gonna i'm gonna live it and i'm gonna i'm gonna set the example and as a preacher and i'm gonna i'm gonna preach the truth and and try to do what i can and and, and try to encourage them hey get closer to god because the holy spirit will do a lot better job convicting your heart on things you need to change than i could ever do that yeah. and so you always believe in them. But then have them also make a pact with them where you commit yourself to pray for them daily. You commit that you're going to have a consistent walk with God. You commit that you're going to be a good public example, a Christian example for them, and you commit to always believing them, but then also have them commit to you to pray for you daily. Ask them to. We all need prayer. Then have them commit that they will encourage you by their example of what a believer should be. What should a believer be? The Bible says in 1 Timothy 4.12, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word. And tell them, hey, I want you to, to remind me. I may have been a Christian for 20 years and been in this church for, for, for so many years. But listen, just, be, just because you're new in the faith doesn't mean you can't teach me something. I want you to take God's word and I want you to apply it and I want you to encourage me to, to stay on point. I want you to keep me sharp too. And you ask them, hey, you be an example of a believer in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. You be, you be an example of what a Christian ought to be because that's going to help keep me sharp. We should never get to the point to where, where oh, he's just, just a new Christian. Oh my, he can't teach me anything. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Iron sharpens iron. Out of the mouth of babes and suckling, thou hast perfected praise. And then have them commit to you that they won't quit when tough times come. They're going to have a Ziklag moment. And they have got to use the time from their wilderness to Ziklag to, to get their hands strong. So that whenever they get to their Ziklag moment, their hand is strong in God and they're able to encourage themselves in the Lord. They're able to do it on their own. That's what Jonathan did. And that's what God wants us to do. God wants to give us Davids. Let's start proofing to him with the Davids that are in our own church right now. If you see yourself as a Jonathan and you see everybody else as a David here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work at strengthening their hand in God. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a good example to them. I'm going to encourage them. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to do what I've got to do. And then let God add to our church. Let God, Matthew 16, 18 says that, that upon this rock, I will build my church. And God is, Jesus is going to build this church as he sees fit. Let's, let's create an atmosphere so that when God, Jesus does bring people in our doors, they're built. They're grown, they're strengthened, their hands are, hands are strengthened in God because there's coming a zigzag in their life. And they're going to have to, we don't know their greatness. We don't know what royalty, we don't know what kingdom they're going to, to, to be reigning over. But we, we've got to get them through that zigzag moment or else they're going to die and never reach their potential. But what was the key? It strengthened their hand in the wilderness. When, when, they, when, the, when they're just a seedling, when nobody can de detect the greatness that's in them. That's the kind of atmosphere that we ought to have here at Harvest Baptist Church. We, where, where there's such a palpable love, where there's such a, a, a palpable uh, compassion one toward another, where we love each other and we, we enjoy spending time with each other and, and, we, and we build each other up and we, and, we, and we lift each other up, encourage each other and strengthen each other's hand in God because we don't know when that Ziklag moment will be. But then also when God brings us other families, we can also be that for them. We can be that Jonathan for them. We can be that Jonathan from them. That's the best way you can help another person is to strengthen their hand in God because one day they're going to have a zigzag moment and they're going to need to be able to do it on their own. It's like, it's like raising children. You don't want to constantly do everything for your children. You want them to eventually learn how to pick up the fork themselves and, and put the fork in their mouth, right? Because you're not going to be all there all the time to, to, to take the fork and open, oh, 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 oh. Zzz, you know how the babies do, or the, the putt-putt, or the, the car, or the, or Caleb, he's, he's fun, he's like, he picks out his vehicle, he's like, do a putt-putt, do a jet, do a car, prim, prim and pop, proper pasture, over here, you should see me over there, putt-putt-putt-putt-putt-putt-putt-putt, <laughs> But we're not going to be there. We have to understand. We've got to, we've got to be able to feed yourself. But sometimes people need that strengthening, and that's okay. But let's, let's take that and, and prepare them for this Ziklag moment. And that's the best way we can help them. But let's start with each other. Let's start by, by, by tying our hearts and helping each other, strengthening each other's hand in God. And that way God can see there's such a sweet spirit at Harvest Baptist Church. I've got a, I've got a, I've got a person who's, whose hearts need healing. And I want to, I think Harvest Baptist Church would be a great place for their heart to be healed and for them to grow and reach their potential for me. And God blesses us with that person. That's my hope and that's my heart's desire is that our church can become a hospital for sinners. And we can, we can be a place where we can strengthen others' hand in God and get them ready for their Ziklag moment so then they can go on and reach their potential for Christ. Amen. Heavenly Father, I praise and thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that you've given us to hear from your word. And I ask you, Lord, to please help us to have the heart of Christ. Help us, Lord, to have a tender heart for each other, our brothers and sisters in Christ here at our church. Lord, I, we're praying, Lord, for new families. We're praying, Lord, that you would bless us, Lord, with people to love and people to minister to. But Lord, you're also watching how we behave with each other. And Lord, if we're not practicing it now, how are, how are you assured that, that we would treat a, a new family different? I pray, Lord, that you please help us to, to prove ourselves to you. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to show the love of Christ with each other. Help us, Lord, to, to make our quiet time our priority so that our hands can be strengthened in God for our own Ziklag moments. But then for us to be a Jonathan in our brothers and sisters' life, our, our church family's life, 
And we can be there for them. We can, we can share with them what, what you taught us in our wilderness moment. And we can help strengthen their hand and help them reach their potential for Jesus Christ. And then the new families and the people that you bring, the visitors that you bring. Help us, Lord, to, to use this peaceful time as a time of growth. I pray, Lord, that you please help us, Lord, to fulfill your will for us being here, Lord. With their heads bowed and eyes closed, let's all stand, please. I'm going to have Miss Melissa play a hymn of invitation. I encourage you to come and use the altar and just ask the Lord, Lord, one, would you, would you please help me to be that Jonathan? Would you help me to, to strengthen my hand, strengthen my hand in, in, in God and help me to strengthen others' hand in God? And, and Lord... Help me to, to, to be working on that for my Ziklag moment. But then also, Lord, help me to, to be, be looking for those opportunities where I can help a David and I can strengthen their hand. Because their Ziklag is coming. It's just a matter of time. May that be our prayer that we can help them get through that Ziklag moment and reach their potential for Christ. Let's pray. Our hymn books and go to number 138, The Haven of Rest, number 138. We'll sing the first and the fourth verse of number 138. My soul in sad exile was out on life's seas. So burdened with sin and distress Till I heard a sweet voice saying Make me your choice And I entered the heaven of rest I anchored my soul in the heaven Sail the white seas no more. The tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep. In Jesus, I'm safe evermore. Oh, come to the Savior, He patiently waits. To save by his power divine, come anchor your 
soul in the haven of rest and say my beloved is mine i've anchored my soul in the haven of rest i'll sail the wide seas no more the tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep in jesus i'm safe evermore amen amen may that be a challenge to our hearts to determine to be that jonathan for the david that god brings into our life and it's a joy it's a joy when the lord provides that opportunity to to encourage that person and to strengthen their hand in god and see god to do a, a great work in their life and just ask god god give me that opportunity it will take your christian life and turn it upside down it'll be so exciting God used me. God used me. What a joy it is. Amen. Well, let's bow for prayer, and uh, we'll be dismissed. Brother Tony, would you please bow, uh, pray for us? Lord, thank you for this time enough this night, Lord, that you've given us to us. Ask the Lord, and uh, may we not just look at his words, but find that we walk out of your Lord. And, and be on the alert for, for any David's in our lives that are in, in a zigzag moment, Lord, so we know that can be up at that same point in time. And what we really want is we're that person. Lord. We want someone to know that brother to come up to us and encourage us and strengthen us in the Lord. Give them a word of encouragement or pat on the back, and, and they would all pray for them. That 